Here we go. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of where we are, where we're up to, for those who were not here last week. We are in between the destruction of the first temple and the rebuilding of the second temple. The majority of the Jewish people, a large section, were in Persia. Uh, many of them lived in the capital of Persia called Shushan. There was a great leader by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, an evil dictator actually, who destroyed the first temple and exiled the Jews. Okay? He was eventually taken over by someone called Balshatzar. Balshatzar was taken over by someone called Ahasuerus. Okay, that wasn't his name, it was a title. Ahasuerus was a uh, dictator, a military force actually, who had taken over a large swathe of land, probably, they say, 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, so a large area. All the Jewish people located within those 127 provinces, so that's very, very important to know. So, Ahasuerus has a party, that's the opening scene of the Megillah. Why does he have a party? And remember, Lauren? To show off. He threw a big party to show off. Yes. Why was he showing off? And what was he showing off? And he was the, like, he was in control. He was in control and taking over the kingdom of the Jewish people. Okay, and he dressed up as the high priest. And he decorated his large palace in Shushan with gold and silver from the temple, as if to say, you guys are staying. He threw this party in the third year for some extra dessert after class. Why the third year of his reign did he throw this party? Why not the second or the fifth? Because in the fifth year of his third year of his reign, it coincided with the seventieth year of the exile of the Jewish people from Israel, according to his calculation, which was wrong. But when his calculation, seventy years was the end, and the prophet Jeremiah predicted and prophesied that the Jewish people would people would return after 70 years. So he looks around and says, you guys aren't returning, you're here to stay. Throws a big, big party, everyone comes to this party, he invites all the people and all the Jews and all the non-Jews come to this party. The Jewish people come to this party. That's the problem. Although the food was kosher and the wine and they had nice bagels and other kosher foods, whatever they ate in those days, they shouldn't have celebrated because it just didn't look good. Celebrating the destruction of the temple, of all the stuff that's there, it wasn't so nice. That, put that away, that's going to come and revisit them a little bit later. Okay. During this party, Ahasuerus gets drunk. It was actually a six month party. He gets drunk during the party and eventually kills his wife Vashti for certain reasons, as we said last class. He has to replace her. He finds, he basically starts kidnapping many, many women and putting them into his private harem. Okay, let's have a look. We're up to right now. So, he's basically gone around, beginning of chapter 2, and he starts to remember what he did to Vashti, and he starts to look for women to marry. What does he do? He has his people kidnap thousands of women and bring them to Shushan. We mentioned this last week, I think, right? And he brings them his private Harim. Enter stage left, Mordechai, the leading rabbi of his day, and his cousin, who according to many opinions he was actually married to, by the name of Hadassah. Why Hadassah? Because Hadassah, we said, are very green leaves. And she is taken and brought to the palace of Ahasuerus. How long is she there for? So before any woman could be taken by the king, she had to live one year and be anointed with various creams and oils upon her request. Many women, by the way, volunteered themselves in order to have this opportunity. Mordechai tells Esther very, very carefully before she goes, whatever you do, do not tell Ahasuerus where you come from. The question is why? So many opinions as to why she kept it quiet. And one is, because if people would have known that she was Jewish, especially Hum and other people, it could have been a threat to her life. And our whole plan that we're going to see eventually today would not have come into fruition to save the Jewish people. So key to saving the Jewish people is that she remains Nistar. Esther Nistar. She has to remain hidden. Okay? And she is in the 
um, Harim. Go to verse 17, please, chapter 2. V'tilakach estel ha-melech ha-chishverosh. Right? This was the seventh year of his reign, and she is taken to Ahasuerus. He then rapes her, basically, and decides that he loves her. Verse 17, V'yahava melech ha-estel mikol nashim from all the women. And we mentioned last week, by the way, that she wasn't 16 or 17, or 22. Some say she was actually in her 40s, 50s, maybe in the 60s. But he absolutely loved her. There was something about her. So much so, all the other women he had taken, he kind of pushed them aside, let some go, end up kidnapping and putting the others in his harem, and that was the end of it. He's found a replacement for Vashti. So now Esther incredibly becomes the leader of the non-free world at that time because Akashverosh was very 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 powerful and he puts the Ketel Malcha Barusha he puts the crown on her head verse 17 and she takes over from the role of Vashti okay 18 so he does something very unusual now Vayasa Melech Mishte Gadol he makes a big party Lachol Sarav to all of his servants Vavadav and his work is Mishta Esther. He calls it the Feast of Esther. Now, one second. Why is he making a feast? Well, one opinion could be that he wants to make a nice feast because he just got married to a beautiful new wife. He's in love with her and he wants to do that. But there's another reason why. He wants to make her jealous. Why does he want to make her jealous? Why does Ahasuerus want to make his new wife? Because he wants her to tell her where she's from. But you won't say. That's why it says, over Hekabetz Betul Hashanis, he gathers women again. Now, he has no desire to marry any of these women, but he's gathering these young women because he wants to get her jealous, because he wants to get out of her. Who are you? Where are you from? She's not saying a word. And what's Mordechai doing? Verse 19. Or Mordechai Yoshev Sharmela. Mordechai is sitting at the gate. Why is he sitting at the gate? Because he wants to hear what's going on with her. He wants to know. He was an important person of himself, but he wants to know what's happening to her. He loved her as well, and he cared for her. And he knew something was going to happen through Esther. He understood that. Still, verse 20, Ain Esther Magedet Molazada Betama. She's being pushed and coerced, and she says, No, no, no. I'm not going to tell you where I'm from. Okay? Just as Mordechai had told her. Okay, now something unusual happens. Verse 21. So the topic changes a little bit, and something happens. Now, Ahasuerus we mentioned was a dictator. Who is the main threat to most dictators? The people who are closest to them. They has two chamberlains who are very close to him. One is called Bigatan, and the other one is called Teresh. And these two chamberlains concoct a plan to assassinate him. Now their jobs are pretty gross actually. One was actually the one who used to remove the waste from his chamber. And the other was the water and food bringer. They worked very, very, very hard, as you can imagine, because he was a very busy man in his private chamber. And they just could not stand him, and they wanted to assassinate him. The intrigue has grown. This is what they do. Follow to verse 21. I'll read the Hebrew, but you can follow in the Hebrew and the English. Now remember, Mordechai has repositioned himself at the entrance to the king's gate because he wants to see what's going on. Basically, that means the center of town, just outside Congress. Basically, right? You with me? Just outside Congress, outside the White House, you get to hear people saying things. He wants to know what's cooking, right? Katza picks up a terrace. These two people get very, very angry. Shneisa Rasiyamel, these two servants of the king, Mishomri Hasaf. They want to kill him. Send the hand against him, they want to kill him. Mordechai overhears this plan. Is that strange? How would Mordechai overhear this plan? Weren't they careful enough not to speak about assassinating the king next to someone like Mordechai? And the answer is that actually they didn't realize Mordechai understood them. Because Mordechai was part of the Sanhedrin. That is the 70-member chamber of rabbis that made decisions in Israel. In order to qualify for that, you had to have an ability. What was that ability? Speak, speak 70 languages. Speak 70 languages. Speak 70 languages. Yeah. We did this last week still? No, you just mentioned it. Ah, speak 70 languages. Yeah. 
he understood what they were saying, and therefore he reported this information. Vayegedla Esther Malki tells Esther, the queen, and he says, Vatoma Esther Lamelach B'Shem He says, go and tell, and she goes and tells Achashverosh. This is very important. She says it in the name of Mordechai, which means she doesn't say, oh, you'll believe what I just heard, without telling you. It says, there's this guy Mordechai. I just overheard. He told me that he overheard these people speaking and they want to kill you. The fact that she did it in his name ends up, we'll see later on, saving the entire Jewish people. They learn out from this a Jewish principle, by the way, which is mentioned in other books. Actually, in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers. They learn out that when you hear information and you want to give it over, you should always say it for shame only in the name of the person you heard it from. When you do that, you're not just saving yourself of that person, you're saving the other person you heard it from as well. You include them in the information. You don't know how that information actually travel back to them. You hear something good or important, I heard something about it, and you know who told me? This person told me. In a positive way. That can bring, they say, redemption to the world. Side point, remember that? Because that thing that he did is going to end up saving the Jewish people. He hangs both of these guys on a tree. And the king writes down this episode in a book. Okay, We're going to see that book a little bit later. Put it inside your hippocampus. There's a lot of moving pieces here, but that's an important one. Okay, chapter three. Are you ready? Ready. Achad varam eila. Now the word the word achar means after. There's two ways to say after in Hebrew. Acharei and achar. Acharei means a long time after. Achar means immediately after. So this, what's about to happen right now, happened immediately after these two guys get killed because Mordechai reported to Esther she overheard them who wants to kill Achashverosh. So everything is moving very quickly at this point. Although the entire story takes seven years to transpire, these events are happening right next to one another. Are we good? Dan, you with me, brother? Fantastic. Gidel HaMelech HaShverosh is Haman. I just said Haman. Boo. Thank you. I appreciate that. So Haman now is starting to rise in power. Now remember, Haman gave Achashverosh advice beforehand. Okay? So we want, so we see that Haman already was on his way up, and now he remembers him. Side point, but important one. This is the only book, as I mentioned last week, in scripture where God's name is not mentioned. However, whenever you see the word Melech, said, that's actually a reference to God. So you can read this verse differently. After these things, Gidel HaMelech, God the King, raised up Achashverosh as Haman. He made Achashverosh lift up Haman. This is all part of God's plan. Or you can read it the basic way, which is, after this, the King Achashverosh lifted up Haman and raised his power. You follow what I'm saying? Two ways to read it. So whenever you see the word Melech, King, it could be referring to the ultimate King, which is God. He is Ben Hamda Taha Agagi, the Agagite. We said he came from Amalek. He makes him very powerful. This is not good because Haman has a big problem with the Jews. The call of the Hamelech, Hashabshah everyone who comes into contact with Haman, Korim or Mishtachavim, that's verse 2, has to bow down and prostrate themselves. What do those words literally mean, bow down and prostrate themselves? Bow down means to bow. Mishtachavim means to literally lie down. Those two words are found in prayers when they talk in reference to God. The fact those two words put together, I said in reference to Haman, means that he started to see himself as a God. This is quite common. If we see even to this very day, dictators start to gain power, and eventually they ascribe to themselves certain godly powers, like the North Koreans. Right? In North Korea, they don't just see these Yong-uns, right, as some kind of like random people. They say, oh, they're powerful, they're godly. Right? They see small g, but they see them have this, and that's what he starts to do. He's really raising himself up. According to our tradition, by the way, he actually pinned an idol onto his jacket or wore it on a chain around his neck. Idol bling. Not good. Okay? Everyone bows down to him. Even the Jews were allowed to bow down to him out of respect. We don't want to diss this big man. You're allowed to bow down. You're not worshiping your person. You bow down to them. However, it says, O Mordechai, lo yichra, doesn't bow down, and he certainly does not prostrate himself in front of this guy, Haman. Okay, and I mentioned last week, 
that Mordechai and Haman are a continuation of a battle that started many, many, many years before with Saul from the tribe of Benjamin and King Agag, the head of Amalek, Haman's great, great, great grandfather. So this is a continuation of a battle that started many, many years before. Or Mordechai Lechra, but he will not bow down. And all the servants turn around to Mordechai and they say, Why are you bowing down? Why are you not fulfilling the mitzvah of the king to bow down? Haman. Every day tell him he doesn't care, he doesn't listen, he says, Absolutely not. Now remember, Haman is extremely wealthy. He's also now extremely powerful. He's also got an extremely large family of many, many children. So he's got a lot going for himself. And everyone is bowing down to him, except one Jew. That's it. This is going to drive him nuts. And is eventually, we're going to see, going to lead to his downfall. Look at verse, we're going to jump to verse 6. The Yavez He's like, I'm not going to just kill Mordechai. Levado, can you give it to Mordechai? Where is he from? He's a Jew. I'm going to blame all the Jews for this one person that annoys me. It's like a very common theme among anti-Semites. I just blame this one guy. They say, oh, he's a Jew. It must be wrong with Judaism. And he wants to kill them all. Vikesh, Haman, Lashmir, it's Koliodim, all the Jews. From all the provinces. I'm going to show him. I'm going to wipe them all out. He made this decision in the first month, the month of Nisan. That's actually how we count the months. Nisan is the first month. That's the month we left Egypt in. So we start counting the months. So he decides that's the month. How, this is very important, how does he decide when he wants to actually kill them, when the right time was? So he does something very interesting. Look at verse 7. Hippil poor. Poor pay vavresh. Poor means a lottery. What's that holiday called? Purim. Weird. So the way he decided when to kill all the Jews was by doing a lottery. What he actually did was he rolled dice. He rolled dice to decide when the right time to kill all the Jews was. That's a poor. Why would that Jewish holiday be called Purim? <laughs> what a strange way to call it. Holiday. Call it the holiday. Mordechai, holiday of Esther, the redemption from Persia, Passover, because God passed over the houses, Hanukkah, so we re rededicated the temple, as we'll see later on in the year. I mean, there's lots of reasons to call it a lot of holidays. Why would you call the holiday after the lottery, dice rolling, that Haman did in order to decide when to kill the Jews? What a strange name to call the holiday. You with me? You following the question, Lauren? You sure? Anybody? Yes, Pauline? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, but maybe because it like turned around on him and he was, wasn't he hung on the day that he was? He was... That's going to happen, so why not call it the hanging holiday? Why is it called lottery? What is a lottery? Luck. Luck. Meaning? Can you control it? It's random. Completely random. You see, Haman represented something called a Malik nation. This nation was all about everything is random. It's all random. There's no God. They're the real first atheists that existed. They, they went far back to the time the Jewish people left Egypt. There were many people believed in gods and idols, but they were the first ones there was nothing. Everything is random. So the way he chose to kill the Jews actually fitted in with his ideology. That everything is completely random, it's all luck, it's all poor. That was his whole world view. So we take that name and we say, under the surface, everything is being planned and directed. So where you wanted a poor, ends up coming back to you. One answer. But that's what he does. He rolls dice. He rolls three dice, actually. And the numbers on the dice court of tradition come up as one, three, three. Now, he rolled the dice again and again and again to decide when exactly was the right time to kill the Jews. The day that he worked out was actually a year's time in the Jewish month of Adar. That's what he ended up. It was like a year after this. What's interesting was that 
The numbers 133 correspond to Hebrew letters. Aleph, Gimel, Gimel. Because one is Aleph, Gimel is three, Gimel is three. Which spells Agag. He's like, there you go. Agag. That's a great, great, great grandfather. He saw this as the right time and he chose that date in Adar, in that month, because he saw the dice fell well on that date. However, on the other side of a 133 are three numbers, which are. What's on the opposite side, opposite side of a die? Oh, what was the question? On the top of a dice, you have one, three, three. What's underneath? Six. Yeah, so, very good. Six, four, four, because it's always every opposite side has to add to seven. It's very interesting that. But every opposite side must add to seven. There's a whole class just in that, why that falls out that way. So we have six, four, four, which has the Jewish letters of Dalit, Vav, Dalit, David, David. You see, that came because what has got God turned around the events and let the dice, as it were, flip to the other side, which ended up being better for us. Okay. So what he chose ended up killing us, ended up, we'll see, killing him. Okay. So he chooses his date, okay, and the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, was chosen as the month that he was going to kill him. Now what he's got to do is tell Ahasuerus and persuade him to allow him to kill the Jews. He says, you know what, Ahasuerus? Yeshno am echad. There is one nation, they are one nation, but they are mafuza mafur, but they're spread out through all your provinces. From all your kingdom. And they're different. They're spread out and they're different. And their laws are different. And what they eat is different. And what they drink is different. They're not like us. You don't need them. Let me wipe them out. Then Haman says, You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you 10,000 silver talents, 10,000 silver chunks, in order to do it. Achashverus responds, no problem, and you can keep the money. And this is the metaphor that the rabbis use to explain this little conversation with Haman and Achashverus. You have two guys who have two fields, one next to the other. One has a big mound of dirt in his field, and the other one has a big hole in his field. And the guy with the hole goes to the guy with the mound and says, I'd like to buy your mound of dirt. And he says, buy my mound of dirt? You do me a favor, take it and fill up your hole. I don't need it, you need it. You're doing me the favor. Same thing. Haman says, I'm gonna wipe away these people, this dirt people. And Achashverosh says, pay me. Keep the money, I'm rich. You're doing me a favor. Achashverosh hated the Jews as much as Haman did. There's a difference. Haman was overt. He told you, I don't like you Jews, I'm gonna kill you. But you're French anti Semite. As opposed to a more seditious and secretive one, who's like, oh, we're friends. Oh, I love the Jews. Yeah, my last business part was Jewish, right? And behind your back, he stabs you. So Ahasuerus was very happy to let this happen. If you read the Megillah, however, Ahasuerus does not come over so bad. He seems such a bad guy. Why? Because after he wrote this, Ahasuerus, after Esther and Mordechai wrote the Megillah, Ahasuerus was still alive and could review it. So Ahasuerus does not seem so bad, but you have to read beneath the surface a little bit and see that actually, because remember after the story, Esther remained married to him. She couldn't escape, so she had to be very careful. So the story is delicate with Ahasuerus, but make no mistake, don't see him as some kind of king with like a, hey, what's going on, you know, with a crown on the side of his head, you know, what's going on over here? He wasn't like that at all, he was very smart, he wouldn't reach the power he did. With, without uh, knowing that. I always had a question about how um, Esther was like allowed to marry a non -Jew. Like I know it's it's bigger. Like, Great, bigger it's a much bigger picture. question. It's a very, very interesting question. But always, like, I'll give you a couple of short ideas why. Number one, it was against her will. Number two, she was meant to do it to save other people. There's a whole discussion. Are you allowed to give up your own life in order to save other people. But who had the prophecy that this was going to happen? Mordecai saw it, both of them did. They were both very great people. Well, they weren't sure how it was going to happen, but after she was chosen, they knew that something was cooking over here, they chose her. Chances were a lottery. Remember, chance is one of the themes that goes right through this. Chances of him overhearing them. Chance of saying this, there's a lot of chance. The whole story is all about chance, okay? She was admitted to do it, and she was considered great to do it. She gave up her life. Then it goes from bad 
two words. Look at verse 10. This episode is crucial. Achishverosh took the ring of his finger and he gave it to Haman. What's that about? He's sharing bling? What, what is that? What does the ring represent? Well, in those days, the ring was a signet ring. He used to put wax onto a decree, onto a length, a loaf or a letter, and he would put your signet. By doing that, you were saying, this must be fulfilled. Ahasuerus takes that ring and gives it to Haman. So now Haman has even more power. He can make any decree that he wants against whoever he wants. That's his response to Haman's decision that he wants to wipe out the Jewish people. It's not good. So rare you did, the hater of the Jews. Right? The Megiddo is even telling you, verse 10. And he says to him, you keep the money, it's yours, do whatever you want. Now the Jewish people hear about this and they start to freak out. Because Haman sends with the seal of Ahasuerus, letters throughout the kingdom to destroy, to slay, to exterminate Jews, young and old, children and women, in a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take all their stuff. Right? Not just to kill them, you can have all their stuff. Right? Like the, um, the Polish people, right? although they don't speak about it in Poland too much. Right? But after the war, they were very happy to, to kill, let the Jews be killed, they take their stuff away, no problem. No problem. And this passed through. What happens, look at verse 16. They carried this right through the kingdom. And look at the last few words. And the city of Shushan was in shock. All the Jews were freaking out. They're like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We're all dead. They're the wealthiest guy sent out based on this day. And by the way, it was terrible for the Jewish people. They would walk around the streets, they would say, and a Persian would come up to them and be like, ha, 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 I'm going to kill you and take all your stuff in a year's time. And, it was, and the Jews were crying, and it was a terrible, terrible time. Chapter 4. The tables are about to turn. Literally. Mordechai Yadez Kol said, Mordechai hears about this decree, obviously, because there he is. But they had to hear about it. It's very interesting. Although he's a very holy person, and normally he could have heard about it through some kind of prophetic means, since he and everyone else was so disturbed about this, you can only receive prophecy, according to Judaism, if you're in a very happy state. Which is why King David, a great prophet, had a harp. Like, why would he have harp? The King David's harp is a very theme. Because they were always playing music. Because music makes you happy. And in order to keep his level of prophecy up, music was played for him. Over here, Mordechai is depressed. He's very upset what's happening to the Jewish people. So Rashi says, Mordechai knew about this whole thing and all the machinations from a dream. It came to through a dream, which is another form of much lower prophetic prophecy. Okay. What does Mordechai do? The first thing he does is, he rips his clothing. Now, what is that about? What's ripping clothing? Does anyone know that gesture to rip clothing? Right, when a person is an Avila mourner for one of the seven close relatives, that is a mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, husband, or wife, what's called the Sheva Krogan, the seven close relatives, when they hear the news, or soon after, they rip their clothing. We shouldn't know such things, but that's what we do, right? For a parent, you rip over the heart, a clothing, outer, outer clothing. For another member, a close family member, rip over the right-hand side. Ripping clothing is a sign of mourning. That's what he does. He does it for effect. He, by the way, clothing again. Now remember, another theme that goes right through the Megillah, clothing. Let's think about it. We saw Ahasuerus dressed up as the Kohen God, the high priest. As uh, Mavashi was told to come out naked, remember, and dance without any clothes on, in order to entertain Ahasuerus and all his people. We saw, um, well, we saw this, right? Has to put on royal clothing. And we see over here that he rips his clothing over here. And then he gets dressed up in something else. The Yilvash Sakta Ifer, he puts on sackcloth and ashes. Ashes. What sackcloth and ashes? This is basically very low quality, dirty clothing with ashes, which is a sign of mourning. And what does he do? He comes into the middle of the city and he starts to scream out and cry. Now, how does a person usually mourn? Quietly, 
in their house. How does a person usually pray? Quietly to themselves and to God, but it's a private thing. However, he does it very publicly. He's trying to get to everyone to notice of what's going on, specifically the Jews. And he calls out and cries out very, very loudly. Okay? Hannah, one of the great Jewish women in Jewish history, right? she prayed because she wanted a child. She didn't have a child. And she prayed quietly. We learn out the concept of private prayer, silent prayer from Hannah. However, we learn from here that when you're dealing with terrible enemies, you cry out loudly in a very bad situation. Not only that, he puts on this cloth, sackle of ashes and he's crying out and this is just a local street. He goes to the king's palace and stands outside screaming and wailing for everyone to hear. Crazy. And he's wearing his clothing. Now what happens? Everyone's like, wow. Like, the chief rabbi, he's out there creeping. Something not good is going on. Everyone hears about it and everyone starts to fast and mourn about this decree from the small people to the big people. Everyone, even the Persianized Jews are freaking out. They're like, we're all going to die. Is it one year? We're all dead. All our stuff is gone. They're making fun of us over here. And they start to fast. Why do they fast? Two reasons. One, fasting is one way that we do repentance, like Yom Kippur. They wanted to take this decree, hope that God would step in and stop this terrible decree. But two, what was their main crime that caused this whole thing, spiritually at least? They opened the door for Haman to enter. They ate from the feast of Ahasuerus. It's like, we shouldn't have gone. We're now not going to eat. See, they came to fix it up, meter can they measure for measure. Can you see that? They ate from the feast, they shouldn't have gone there. It was kosher food. They shouldn't have been there. It wasn't nice. So they said, you know what? We regret that. We're not going to fast. Okay. Vetavona naros Esther. Now Esther is now, she's secreted in the, uh, in the castle. Right? Speak out. She doesn't know what's going on. But people say, by the way, Mordechai is outside screaming, crying, wearing sackcloth and ashes. She knows something terrible has happened. What happens to her when she hears? It says in chapter 4, which means she became greatly distressed. And actually, according to many opinions, she was pregnant and she had a miscarriage when she heard this terrible news. And it was such a difficult time for her that for the rest of her life she couldn't have any more children except one who she actually had through Ahasuerus, who ended up becoming Darius, Bar Yavesh, who Darius was the one who allowed the Jewish people to go back and rebuild the second temple. He was actually Jewish, the son of Esther. I don't know if he identified as Jewish because he was Ahasuerus' son, but he took over and he's allowed the Jews later on to return to the land of Israel. That's coming. About to this point, terrible time. She's very upset and she says, Whoa, Mordechai is out? Screaming in public, something bad must have happened, which doesn't just affect to him or he'd be mourning at home, it's probably affecting everyone. And she says, You can't dress like that outside the king's palace. So she sends him new clothing. Look at verse 4. She sends him clothing. Take your clothes off. You can't walk around wearing sackcloth and ashes. You're outside the king's palace. It's a crime. The lucky bell. He wasn't buying it, he didn't accept it. No, 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 no. I know what I'm doing over here. I need to wear this clothing. This is what I'm about right now. I'm not going to stop for one second to put on this clothes if people think it's any, for some other reason. Now, Esther realizes she has to open up communication with Mordechai. Okay? So she finds the perfect candidate. His name in the Megillah is Hasach. Or Hatach. Actually, according to tradition, that is Daniel the prophet. Him from the lion's den, the great prophet was thrown into the lion's den and survived. A very elderly and holy person, a great prophet of the Jewish people. Why is he called Hatach? Because Hatach means cut in half. Because he was really powerful before, then Ahasuerus took over and his power halved. Okay, and some say he made the ability to cut decrees. He was still a born person. Two opinions. Anyway. She goes up to him and says, you've got to get this message out to Mordechai. I want to know what's going on. 
סביר שנייה, מלך השם העמיד לפניו את זה, על מוד אוכל, לדעת מה זה, יא מה זה. What is happening over here? Why is this happening? What did we do wrong that could have led to this? ויצא התח על מרדכי, על רוחו בעיר. Now, interesting, when he goes to see him, it says in verse 6, he goes via the major highways. He doesn't take secret streets. Why? So I think they call this hiding in plain sight. You see, had he met with them privately, they would have found out and it would have been bad news for him. Actually, it was going to be bad news, but we'll see in a second. He meets him publicly, he takes all the public highways in order to meet Mordechai, right? Not sneaking around, not to cause too much suspicion. And Mordechai tells him exactly what a Malik, Haman in this case, plan is. Right? There's partial a kesef and other money which he was willing to pay in order to wipe out the Jews. Okay? And about the decree that was sent out to all the provinces that everyone was allowed to kill the Jews on this date, on this day in Adar. Okay. The time has come. Mordechai tells Daniel to tell Esther, go and tell Ahasuerus who you are and where you come from. It's time to out yourself and tell him you're a Jew. It's time to save the Jewish people. Now that seems like a simple request, but my friends, it was a suicidal mission. Crazy. And she's actually going to say no. Watch carefully. He says to her, look at the last words in verse 8, plead with him for her people, i.e. tell them who you are, where you're from. And then he goes, So Daniel the prophet goes to Esther and says, I have this message from Mordechai. He sees the go between. Go and tell that she's got to tell who she is. She responds in verse 9, but Tomer Esther Lahatach to Mordechai. Call Avdi Melech, verse 11. Everybody knows. Vamidin is no matter where you're from, whether you're a male or a female, that you cannot just walk in to see the king. They had a very incredible, unusual law. Ahasuerus was so powerful and started to see himself as such a godly figure that you needed 30 days permission to go and see the king. Even his wife did. Lauren, I tried this law in my house. I said, before my wife could speak to me, I said, dear, 30 days permission. And you know what? My lymph is improving by the day. Doctor will be walking normally very soon. Right. Even his wife had to have 30 days permission. Can you believe that? So she turns around, tells Daniel and says, he's going to kill me. I'm not going to die over this. And Daniel goes back and tells Mordechai. Mordechai gives probably the most profound words to her, which ring true to this very day. Look what he says to her via Daniel the prophet. He says, Verse 12, says, Go and tell Esther, Don't think in your soul. This is these words. This is, this is so 2016, it's amazing. Don't think just because you are in the king's palace, Limalet, you'll be able to escape the fate of the Jewish people. Oh, you think you're okay? You think you're in the palace? Everything's going to be good? Says, make no mistake. A number of possibilities can happen. One, someone else is going to come along, kill Achashverosh, and kill you as his wife. Two, someone's going to out you as a Jew, and you're going to get killed that way. You're not safe. Here we are, in the safety of America, Jews are being attacked in Israel, Jews are being attacked in France, and in Belgium, and wherever they are, we're safe here. Mordechai's words ring true. Don't think here we are, a nice palace, and it's a good place to be, that we're safe from the anti-Semitism that is occurring around the world. It can travel. That's what he's saying to her. Key, the verse 14. Im hacharish tacharishi, which tacharish means if you become mute, if you become silent, but it says it twice. If you become very, very silent at this time, the A Sahi, Reva Batsala, redemption will come and a savior will come, Yamod will stand, Leodin for the Jewish people, Mimakamacher from another place. 
In other words, the job's going to get done. The Jews are going to be saved. Mordechai was certain of that. God would not let the Jewish people die out. It's a promise given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all our ancestors. The Jewish people will always be here. We can go through pogroms and holocausts and exiles and you name it. We're always going to be here. This is your job. Don't think you're going to escape. And if you don't want to do it, someone else will do it. And it won't be Megillat Esther. It'll be Megillat Shoshana, Sarah, or Barbara. But the job's going to get done. It's your choice. And then he says something even crazier. Umi or Dan, who knows? Maybe this is the reason you became queen in the first place. Now we know through hindsight that it was, but at the time it wasn't so clear. Maybe this is the exact reason. That means everything that happened to your entire life, the fact you were orphaned as a child, the fact that I took you in, the fact that I married you, the fact you were taken by Hashverosh, that you were chosen to be queen, the fact that you were lifted up, and the fact that you fell in love with you, and all this came down to this one moment, your entire life could come down to one decision. Think about your life. It happens, right? Think about one decision you made. It could have gone that way, your life would have gone that way, could have gone that way, your life could have gone that way. Right? You had those moments in your life, you look back like, oh my goodness, had I just said no at that moment, when I said yes, I would be in a completely different place. It's one decision, and she's got to make it. Fatoma Esel Hashiva Mordechai, she says, okay, I'll do it. She says, Lech, go. Kenos es kola yodim. Gather together all the Jewish people. Now that's the important beginning of the plan. Gather all the people together. Because Haman described us as disunified and spread out, i.e. ineffective. She turns around and says, if we're going to succeed, there has to be Jewish unity. So Kenos, right, Knesset, same word, right, Kenos, gather together all the Jewish people, and so Bishan, the ones in Shushan, the ones who are far away, you have no time to get to them. By the way, why was Mordechai so adamant to act so quickly? I mean, this is like, he hears about the decree, he runs out, screaming, shouting, he says, quickly tell us to go see the Jewish people now. Run and see. What are you rushing for? It's not another year. So a number of answers to this question. One answer is that it was the month of Nisan. Nisan is a month of redemption. Jewish people get saved in Nisan. So he knew it was an opportune time. Two, he knew the Jews were freaking out. When do you want to get the Jews to act on it? When they're still in shock. Because after six months of freaking out, what are they like? Like, oh, we're never going to get out of this. They would have given up. So you've got to get them right at the beginning. So it's an opportune time. It was Nisan. And maybe this was the only opportunity that they had, because maybe Esther will be taken over another queen. She's like, get in there, and get in there right now. She says, I'm going to go gather all the Jews from Shushan, and we do something unbelievable. All the Jews, including myself, she says, are going to fast for three days and three nights. No food, no water. Now, when you stop Jews eating for three days and three nights, you know we mean business. I mean, if we missed lunch, we're already like freaking out. Imagine that. Three days and three nights. She says, fast for me. Don't eat. Don't drink. Yom on the Lila. The Yom. The Gamani Narasai at Sumkain. And I too am going to fast. And then I'm going to come to the king. And she says, and who knows? Kasher Avadati Avadati. Which means, I was lost. And maybe I will be lost. Which means I was lost spiritually by being taken by this maniac, and maybe I'll be killed. If that's what's meant to be, that's what's meant to be. She resigns herself to her fate. Vayavor Mordechai. Mordechai passes over. Now check this out. He has a discussion with Esther and disagrees. She says, we can't fast for three days. Why not? Because the third day of the fast is Passover. That's when it fell. Right? Middle of Nisan. We can't have all the Jews fast on Passover. We can have Pesach dinner, matzah, maror, haggadah, kids telling stories. She turns around to him and says, We're not going to need Passover. We're all going to be dead next year. And that year, there was no Passover. They cancelled it and they all fasted the first day of Pesach. It coincided. And actually, she's going to walk in to see Ahasuerus on the first day of Passover. What happens when she walks in, we will see next week. And we will pick up at that point because she's gonna walk in and she's gonna do something very, very unusual. That's if she survives, which I'm not gonna tell until next week.
Aquí no está perdido. Es que es que...